I want to briefly introduce a little bit about the topic today and our two speakers. So first of all, quiz. Now, for most of the audience here who are experienced and many have a little gray hair, this is sort of a nonsensical question, but perhaps just conceivably for some of our graduate students and PhD postdoc, they may have a little difficulty in defining the meaning of the word hepatitis. Anybody want to volunteer? Yeah, what? Right, so it's from the Greek itis, meaning inflammation. So appendicitis, pneumonitis, et cetera, et cetera. So this is very important because the whole history of uh, liver disease um, in its uh, beginning was based on simple principles. One was you looked at people and they were yellow, uh, and most of the uh, stories of uh, epidemic, huge epidemics which influenced history uh, were based upon finding most people who were jaundiced and sick. Of course, you realize now that with probably every form of hepatitis, the, the jaundice part of it is just like the tip of an iceberg, and many, 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 many more people uh, have inflammation of the liver without being jaundiced. But the other point is the whole history of hepatitis is based upon pathology and looking for signs of inflammation, maybe in autopsies back in the 19th century and then later in, in liver biopsies. But uh, the, the whole realization of the existence, uh, the, the discovery of the family of viruses uh, so causing uh, viral hepatitis has got to be one of the more dramatic and exciting uh, stories in medicine of the past 40 years or so. Uh, at one point, I remember this so well myself, when people went into a hospital and had to have blood transfusions. Uh, if you had more than one, I think the, for the chances of getting hepatitis after surgery and after transfusion was, I don't know, something like maybe 60% or so. It was really rather serious, and, and many people got sicker from the transfusion hepatitis, perhaps, than the surgery. But great discoveries were made, and one of the discoverers is one of our speakers, uh, Harvey Walter, today. And uh, I was recently uh, reading uh, Francis Crick's version of the double helix, and somebody you know, asked him, so after all of this, well, what did it feel like? What's the message? And he referred to a uh, uh, 19th century English painter, John Minton, whom I looked up, who wrote a remarkable thing about the excitement of doing something that nobody's ever seen before perhaps even if it's wrong, but if it's right, it leads to something. So Minton said the important thing is to be there when the picture is painted. It takes a bit of luck, perhaps, to be there at the right time, uh, but it also takes curiosity and uh, asking questions and not accepting everything for granted. Ergo, the introduction to Harvey. Uh, who uh, will be actually be our first speaker. Uh, Harvey is very, of course, well known here. He graduated from the University of Rochester Medical School, uh, came to the NIH in 1961 as a clinical associate, uh, spent some time at Georgetown as a house officer, came back, and in 1969 joined the Clinical Center Department of Transfusion Medicine and as, as a senior investigator. And now he's uh, a distinguished investigator, chief of the infectious disease section and associate director of research of the Department of Transfusion Medicine. Well, Harvey was on the scene when, with fairly simple methodology, namely an immunodiffusion plate, uh, he and Barry Blumberg uh, really uh, broke uh, the first uh, uh, major uh, obstacle. No one had been able to culture a hepatitis virus. There were volumes that were written of people trying to do it. 
mimicking what had been done with polio virus, but unsuccessfully and often leading into blind alleys. But it was that discovery of the Australia antigen that led to a diagnostic test, a way of eliminating much of hepatitis from the blood bank, and Harvey then went on to, uh, which he will tell you about, to discover what later became known as hepatitis C virus. Well, uh, Harvey's probably one of our most uh, distinguished and honored uh, uh, members of you know, the institution here. He's a recipient of the Canada Gardner International Award in 2013. Uh, he was a recipient of the Lasker Award. He's a member of the National Academy, the Institute of Medicine, and so forth and so on. Uh, <clears throat> and so Harvey's going to talk uh, about the hepatitis, well, the history of hepatitis for 2,000 years. Um, and one might ask the question whether the hepatitis virus alphabet uh, is going to continue, and if so, for how long? Is it likely to be more? Have we reached the end of the line? And that sort of brings us to the topic that John Coffin is going to discuss. Now, John is also an extremely distinguished scientist, a retrovirologist, who amongst his many accomplishments has been the fact that he's been commuting from Tufts University Medical School, where he's American Cancer Society research professor, and he's been commuting for about 17 years. And the reason why he does it is because in 1997, he was made director of the HIV drug resistance program uh, here in the NCI. Uh, uh, John is also a member of the National Academy, and he's been a major encouragement uh, to this course because even when it started at Tufts, he was part of the faculty, and by my count, he has the all-time record of appearing in 15 of the years that we have had this course for which we are most grateful. And the reason is because he always has remarkable accomplishments uh, dealing mainly with HIV uh, and discovery of many important points that I will not take the time to deliver. But uh, today, he's going to talk uh, about some of that, I guess, but also this major question of, you know, where do viruses come from? Somehow it's easy to think that bacteria, which have the capacity to, to grow themselves and have the machinery to do it, well, they sort of came somewhere along the phylogenetic tree. But viruses, of course, are different. Uh, they're small. They're diverse. Uh, nobody saw one until the electron microscope was developed. I think that's true. And most importantly, they require a host cell in order to stay with it. People have asked, are they alive? Well, inside the host cell, they certainly are. But, you know, they lack ribosomes. They don't make ATP. So where did they come from? And uh, as near as I can figure out, there are three major theories. One is that they are sort of mobile genetic elements that somehow gain the ability to move from one cell to the next. Uh, it's also written that they perhaps are descendants of some free living organisms that somehow adopted a parasitic replication strategy, which the viruses have. Or maybe they existed before anything else did. Maybe they led to the evolution of cellular life, for which there is there's very interesting literature written about. Or maybe it's none, or maybe it's all. At any rate, where viruses come from, of course, is extremely important. And we, as you know, are inundated by viruses. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Tony Fauci talked about the emerging diseases, extending diseases, almost all of which were viral diseases. And those of you here may remember one slide that Tony showed that was just covered with the names of viruses coming out of, for the most part, equatorial uh, 
Africa or South America. And I would call your attention to today's New York Times, where it says the World Health Organization has declared an emergency over Zika virus, uh, which is related to microcephaly in pregnant women, perhaps. At any rate, uh, viruses are more than casual things, and they're, of course, an important part of our genome. Well, we'll hear more from John after first, Harvey, if you would proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Wynn. Uh, that was actually the first time I knew what hepatitis meant. Uh, thank you. Um, but today I'm going to try to cover three viruses over 2,000 years, uh, which roughly breaks down to uh, one century per minute of my lecture. So uh, buckle your seats here. Uh, but first I have to give uh, the traditional financial disclosure. I actually told this class before, you, you know, mystified people that people work at NIH only dream about having uh, financial disclosures. Uh, but uh, wait, uh, this just in. The government has just sequestered dreaming. Uh, but uh, so I do have some other non-financial disclosures, namely that my guiding scientific principle is that to steal from one is plagiarism, but to steal from many is research. <laughs> Secondly, nothing I say reflects the position of the U.S. government, which instantly gives it great credibility and, and, and relevance. And third, my memory is not as sharp as it used to be, and also my memory is not as sharp as it used to be. Now, this is the time when hepatitis history began with Hippocrates in around 400 B.C. Hippocrates is one of the great medical observers of all time. And he, he was the first to describe icterus uh, for yellowing the skin, kiros for hardening of the liver. He was, he was a great observer, but a, a very poor speller. Uh, but Hippocrates gave us the medical oath, which was physician, first do no harm. Little people know, people don't know, that he also said physician, second, get paid up front, and do not take Medicare. <laughs> Now, fortunately for this lecture, uh, nothing much happened over the next 2,000 years, uh, except there were a lot of wars. And in every war, there were soldiers who came down with jaundice uh, and nausea, diarrhea. Uh, it, was, it was a real impediment to battle because uh, the numbers were great. And this became known as campaign jaundice or vaccine-induced jaundice. Uh, but out of that became the distinction between hepatitis A, infectious hepatitis, and hepatitis B, uh, serum-transmitted hepatitis. But through that whole 2,000 years, there was no observation of a viral particle, a hepatitis viral particle. There was no test. Uh, it was before molecular biology. Uh, so nothing happened until 1960s, early 1960s. Uh, one fortuitously <clears throat> uh, here at Building 4 in Blumberg's laboratory where I was working as a fellow. Uh, Blumberg was looking for inherited differences in, in uh, serum lipoproteins, polymorphisms. Uh, and the characteristic of these using an agar gel plate was that when you saw a precipitin line, which was white, and you applied a lipid stain, it turned blue. Uh, so while uh, I had gotten involved with Dr. Bumberg and while looking uh, for more of these lipoprotein polymorphism, one day the precipitin line did not take up the lipid stain, but instead stained red. Uh, and it turned out to be a reaction between a multiply transfused hemophiliac patient who we're using as a source of antibody. And that day we happened to be testing Australian Aborigines uh, and, it, and it first became known as the red antigen, uh, that only persisted for a short time, and then the Australia antigen, uh, which was based on naming it after hemoglobins were being named after the country of origin of the patient. 
I wanted to name it the Bethesda antigen, but that uh, Bloomberg was senior. Uh, in any event, um, the early years, uh, my, my first job as a fellow was to take this antigen and look for clinical relevance. So we tested more aborigines, and 10% were, were positive for the antigen. Uh, but then when I looked at healthy blood donors, only 0.1% were positive, a dramatic difference. Then looking at patients at the clinical center, 10% uh, of leukemic patients were positive, uh, but 0 to 1% of patients with other diseases. So uh, this, and in fact, in the first paper, uh, it was called a new antigen in leukemia sera. And in the discussion, there was a postulate that maybe this antigen uh, was related, was part of a leukemia virus, which people thought uh, might exist at that time, and which still might exist uh, for all we know. Um, so that was the beginning. This is a picture of myself and Bloomberg in the later years, uh, a picture taken by Jay Hoofnagel, actually. Uh, I show it because uh, I want you to contrast it to this was a picture of me when I was first working with Dr. Bloomberg as a, as a PHS fellow wearing the uniform of the, at the time. And as you can see, very little has changed except for my dress uh, over these many years. Now, now Blumberg, I want to show you, looks like Hippocrates. Uh, if Hippocrates wore glasses or Blumberg had a beard, uh, they would look almost, almost the same. And Blumberg was indeed like Hippocrates. He was a philosopher, and he liked to hypothesize. He hypothesized a lot. So his hypothesis here was he thought that he was a geneticist. So he thought this was, uh, the Australian antigen was inherited in some way and gave predisposition to disease, particularly leukemia. So he said, well, let's look at patients uh, who have a, a inherited propensity to leukemia. And that was patients with Down syndrome. Now, by this time, Blumberg had left NIH. He was at the Institute of Cancer Research in Philadelphia. But this turned out to be a pivotal uh, a hypothesis, even though based on wrong premise. And because they then looked, he and Tom London and others then looked at Down's patients living in large institutions where 28% were antigen positive. But if they lived in small institutions, uh, only 3%. And if they weren't institutionalized, it was 0%. And at birth, it was 0%. So this killed the genetic hypothesis, uh, though Bloomberg was reluctant to give that up. Uh, but it said this was a condition of large institutions of uh, unsanitary conditions, as, as these were. It was the first clue for an infectious origin of the Australia antigen. And then again, serendipitously, a technician in Bloomberg's lab came to work one day uh, feeling terrible. Uh, and turning yellow, and she tested her own blood, and she was found to be antigen positive, even though she had been the antigen negative uh, control. Uh, so this suddenly, the lights went off. I wasn't there at the time, but uh, this suddenly made things click, and, and the puzzle came together. That uh, uh, here you had this single line in an agar gel plate that the uh, the, the institutionalized gave the hint towards infectious disease. The technician developing jaundice as she seroconverted for Australia antigen. And the leukemic patients were positive because once they got the infection, they were immunosuppressed and they could not clear it. They became chronic carriers in the vast majority. So <clears throat> there was the link to hepatitis. That was around 1969. Now, I'm going to go on now. There was a lot that came after that uh, in elucidating the hepatitis B virus. I don't have time to go through every, every nuance. Uh, but Lou Barker is sitting here, and he was one of the, the key players in the, in the early elucidation of the hepatitis B virus. Um, and uh, Bob Purcell, who I will get up to in a minute. But hepatitis B is a global problem. Uh, Two billion people have been infected at some point in their life. 350 million people are chronic carriers as of this time. It's a leading cause of cirrhosis uh, and hepatocellular carcinoma worldwide. 
Uh, it causes 80% of all hepatocellular carcinoma in Asian Americans. Uh, <clears throat> interestingly, whereas uh, hepatitis C is usually a, have cirrhosis before you get cancer, with hepatitis B, uh, you can get cancer even before uh, there is cirrhosis. Uh, it's second only to tobacco as a the most common uh, cause of cancer deaths. Uh, and it's 50 to 100 times more infectious than HIV. So this is the global distribution of hepatitis B, where red is 8% uh, or higher uh, incidence uh, prevalence in the population. Uh, you can see it's mostly in Asia, uh, uh, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Eskimo populations of North America, and upper parts of Brazil. Most of the hepatitis B we have in America right now is coming to us because of immigration, large immigration from Asia, uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, from South America, and from Europe, uh, and particularly among the Asian population of the U.S. where the prevalence is still very high. Now, hepatitis B is transmitted in, in multiple ways, uh, but I just want to point out two things. Uh, one is the that uh, in newborns of, of long-term carriers, 90% uh, of the newborns will themselves become carriers. Uh, and this sets up this vicious cycle in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, where an antigen-positive mother who's E-antigen-positive, as I'll show you in a moment, uh, transmits to her daughter. Her daughter has a 90% chance of becoming a chronic carrier. The daughter has babies, and they have a 90% chance of becoming a And this sets up this cycle. That's why there's so much infection there. The other, the other point is that in, in the developing world, healthcare practices are probably a big part of transmission. Uh, everything from witch doctors to scarification practices to non-disposable needles, non-disposable uh, vials, syringes, et cetera. In the U.S. and developed world, uh, uh, sexual transmission of hepatitis B is quite efficient, uh, as is intravenous drug use. Uh, this is a very simplified diagram of the uh, molecular organization of hepatitis B, uh, but it will show you the key points, namely that the Australia antigen turned out to be the envelope of the hepatitis B virus. Uh, and so, uh, well, it is the envelope, but it exists in multiple forms. These small spherical particles, tubule forms of the same diameter, and these are present in huge excess compared to the real virion, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, and it's this mass of antigen and protein, uh, hepatitis B protein, that allowed it to be detected by a simplistic techniques such as agagel diffusion. You would not have found hepatitis C uh, by this technique. There are four major genes uh, for the hepatitis B virus. It's a small virus, a uh, small genome, but it's very complex and ro rolls around. Uh, but there are the genes for the surface antigen. There is the genes for the DNA polymerase, a gene for the nuclear capsid or core antigen. And from that gene comes a soluble protein called hepatitis B E antigen. Uh, core does not get into the serum, but the E antigen gets into the serum. It's a marker for rep rep replication level. It's similar to measuring DNA polymerase or HBV DNA, but not as sensitive. Uh, and then there's an X protein whose functions are not really well understood, may be related to induction of cancer, uh, probably has some role in the replication cycle. Uh, but those are the key points I want you to remember uh, on B. And the disease, if you, it has a, uh, a strange pattern of disease. Let's say you're a baby, you have an E antigen positive mother, you, you're born to an E antigen positive mother, uh, you are uh, yourself E antigen positive. You, early on, and for a long time, you're in what's called the immune tolerant state where you have high levels of HBV DNA, but no inflammation of the liver, so-called hepatitis. Uh, uh, your ALT, alanine aminotransferase levels are normal. 
Then after a decade or two decades, you go into a period called the immune clearance phase, uh, where you're still E antigen positive, you have chronic hepatitis, and the levels of DNA are coming down, but they're fluctuating, the ALT levels are fluctuating up and down. But gradually, you enter the inactive carrier state where the HBV DNA level comes down to baseline, ALT levels are normal, and you may go in that state for a long time, but you may at any point reactivate, especially if you're immunosuppressed, uh, but you may reactivate and the hepatitis will flare. There's a switch over from E antigen negative to anti-HB positive as you go from the immune clearance to the ina inactive state. This immune clearance is T cell mediated predominantly. And in the clinical course, uh, one goes from uh, acute to chronic infection. As I said, 90% of infants who get infected go that way. But less than 5% of adults who get hepatitis B uh, progress to chronic hepatitis. Most people spontaneously clear the infection. Once you have chronic infection, uh, you can proceed to cirrhosis and or liver cancer. Once you have cirrhosis, you can decompensate, and about 23% of patients will have decompensated liver disease, going to liver failure uh, if they have cirrhosis over five years. Uh, and then if you have liver cancer or liver decompensation, uh, you may be salvaged by a liver transplant, and if not, you, you will go on to die. It's, uh, chronic B is the sixth leading cause uh, indication for liver transplantation right now. Uh, so I want to talk about a little bit the hepatitis B vaccine, because that's been a critical thing. Early on, uh, Dr. Purcell and Dr. John Jaron here at NIH uh, made the first foray at a hepatitis B vaccine. And they isolated using rate zonal centrifugation these little spherical particles or tubule particles, and they made a su <coughs> subunit vaccine out of this, distinguishing that from what came known uh, as a Dane particle. The Dane particle is the whole virion. Here you can see the envelope, the nucleocapsid uh, uh, inside of it. So this is what you don't want in your vaccine. This is what you do want in these early vaccines. Uh, they were plasma derived. Uh, this proved to be very efficacious in the chimp model, but didn't go on to commercialization. Uh, uh, the commercialization went to a Merck company. This is Maurice Hilleman, one of the great vaccinologists of the world. Uh, and he took a uh, serum derived. He, he, he also extracted particles from, from a whole plasma, uh, mostly from gay men at that time, and made a, a very effective vaccine. The efficacy was proven by Wolf Schmunis and Clad Stevens at the New York Blood Center, who did a trial in, in gay men in New York City. It was a remarkable trial, uh, 1,000 people in the trial, 500 in the placebo arm and, uh, and 500 in the uh, vaccine arm. 95% of the immunized subjects were uh, pro developed protective antibody called anti-HBS. The vaccine antibody persisted for 24 months. We now know it may persist for a lifetime. The attack rate was 3.2% in the vaccine group, but 25% uh, uh, in the placebo group. And if everybody got the full dose of three doses of vaccine, it was almost 100% efficacious. Uh, this was <clears throat> this led to a study in Taiwan by Palmer Beasley, uh, where these nine, instead of getting 90% of children who are antigen positive mothers getting chronically infected with vaccine and hepatitis B immune globulin, it went down to 5%. Palmer Beasley did another very vital study. He looked at the Taiwanese uh, government workers, 22,000 of them, imagine the magnitude of this study. Uh, and he looked for, there was a group that was antigen positive when the study began, and a group antigen negative. He looked at the causes of death. <clears throat> in the antigen positive group, there were 105 deaths. 40 of them were due to cancer, 17 due to cirrhosis. So more than half died of hepatitis B-related events. There were twice as many deaths in the negative group, but there, because uh, it was a much larger group, but there only two had cirrhosis and only one had cancer. Uh, so this was uh, 
incredible study. The risk of getting cancer if you had the antigen was more than 200-fold higher than if you didn't have the antigen. Uh, incredible risk. Uh, so what's the effect of this vaccine now? Now we got follow-up studies, more recent follow-up studies, again from Taiwan, that uh, the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma Taiwan introduced universal vaccination in 1984. Uh, if you, uh, since that time, the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma has decreased more than half. Mortality has decreased uh, almost uh, three quarters. Uh, it's been highly effective. If, if this were done now, the rates would be even lower. It's a, a total, uh, totally vaccinated population. One of the findings that came out of studies also in Taiwan was that if you had high levels of HBV DNA, over a million copies, that you had a much higher risk of getting hepatocellular carcinoma. This led to the thought, well, let's bring the HBV DNA level down, which could be done in recent years using nucleoside and nucleotide inhibitors. And when you do that, uh, the HBV DNA can become non-detectable. Uh, so here, after three years on Entecavir, one of the inhibitors, 100% of the recipients had non-detectable HPV DNA, 87% with tenofovir, uh, and that has proven uh, to be not just lowering the DNA, but actually uh, causing improved disease. So 96% after six years had improved histology, less inflammation, 88% had reduction in fibrosis and no progression of fibrosis, which would have happened without the treatment. So pretty remarkable. So for a summary of hepatitis B, uh, we have primary prevention, a vaccine that's greater than 95% protective uh, at a reasonable cost. Uh, the goal is to get universal birth vaccination throughout the whole world. It's quite remarkable in the last decade how many countries have now got universal birth vaccination for hepatitis B. There's still a long way to go, but this is a high priority for the World Health Organization. Uh, and it's conceivable that you could eradicate hepatitis B. If everybody could get vaccinated, it could be like a smallpox, and you could uh, virtually eradicate it over the next uh, three, perhaps five decades. That's debatable, but it, uh, it's possible. As I mentioned with treatment, uh, we can't cure hepatitis B right now because there is a, uh, uh, an intranuclear driver of replication called coval covalently closed circular DNA, uh, or CCC DNA, which is not targetable by current drugs. They don't get into the nucleus. They can't break the circle and kill, kill this thing. But uh, we can suppress. Uh, I just told you, uh, you can, these points I've just gone through, that you can suppress the virus, you can improve the disease, you can prevent hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, while all this was going on, I was doing side studies, uh, evidence-based studies, which is very important these days, and I did an evidence-based study on the chance of a man winning an argument at different, different stages of his relationship. As you can see, um, while you're dating, you have a 50-50 chance of, of winning an argument. It goes down to about 25% during engagement, and uh, once married, uh, <laughs> you, you don't stand a chance. Uh, yeah. So I want to jump now to hepatitis E virus. Um, this is, uh, in 1978, there was a huge waterborne epidemic uh, in Kashmir caused 20,000 icteric cases, 700 cases of fulminant hepatitis, 600 deaths. It was thought to be a hepatitis A virus, uh, but, uh, but it turned out not to be once, once the test for A came along. Uh, and then in 1980, there was another epidemic, this time in Afghanistan, among Russian sol soldiers who were in Afghanistan before we were. Uh, a big epidemic. Again, it wasn't HIV-related. And then in 1983, Dr. Balian, a Russian investigator, swallowed fecal extract in his own self-experiment. He swallowed fecal extract from nine of the acute cases in the Afghan epidemic and recovered a 27 to 30 nanometer virus-like particle in his own acute phase stool. 
great paper, <laughs> dangerous experiment. He got very sick. Uh, uh, and then the CDC recovered an identical virus-like particle uh, from macaques uh, given uh, infectious stool. Uh, so for you young people, if you're going to do an experiment of transmission, better to use a macaque <laughs> than yourself. Uh, and then in 1990, uh, the, uh, Reyes and his group at Gene Labs took uh, a bile from a synomologous macaque and used differential hybridization in the early days of molecular biology, and they cloned the hepatitis E virus. This is the hepatitis E virus. Uh, looks like a, a piece of roasted cauliflower to me. Uh, it now has its own family, the hepiviridae family, the genus hepivirus. It's a non-enveloped, importantly, different from B and C. It's non-enveloped. It's 27 to 34 nanometers. It's a single-stranded RNA virus. Uh, there are four genotypes, uh, but fortunately only one serotype. So any given test will detect all four uh, genotypes. Its distribution, not too different from B. Uh, it's mostly in Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, um, Northern Africa this time. Uh, but there, these genotypes have importance, and genotypes one and two <clears throat> are found. Genotype one is the Asian variant, uh, North African variant. Genotype two in, has been found in Mexico and in Western Africa. Uh, but genotypes three and four are the ones that are most concerned for us right now. Three is found in Europe and the U.S., uh, and four has been found uh, was for only in, only in China. But so the epidemiology is quite different of these two. So genotype one and two are epidemic, the viruses that cause these vast outbreaks. These are the water, waterborne outbreaks. Uh, they occur mostly in younger people. Uh, the agent is actually a human agent. Uh, there's some seasonality. It can cause fatal disease in pregnant women for reasons which aren't totally known. Uh, and uh, it has some extra hepatic manifestations, particularly pancreatitis, and it doesn't become chronic. In contrast, genotype 3, the one that we have in America and Europe, uh, some, for some reason has a male preponderance. Uh, it occurs in older people. Uh, it's a foodborne uh, epidemic, as we'll get into. It's a swine agent, it's primarily a, a virus directed at swine that we get secondarily, although other animals as well. Uh, there is some fatality in elderly people. The extra hepatic manifestations are in the central nervous system. Uh, but and just recently learning that it can cause chronicity, but only in the immune deficient. The prevalence of this, of this agent in the U.S., at least by antibody, is very, uh, very frequent. Uh, in CDC studies done in 1988 90 to 94, the, the rates of IgG antibody were at 21%. A later study in 2009-2010, it dropped to 6%. The CDC feels this is a real change in the epidemiology of the virus, but some of it is, I think, uh, test-related. Um, Bob Purcell, by the way, developed some of the first tests for hepatitis E virus. Uh, we did our study using a, Jap a Chinese assay. We found 21.8% uh, in 2006, dropped to 16% by 2012. And then recently, the Red Cross has done a, a good study where the prevalence is 7.3% in healthy U.S. donors. I think that may be, may be the real figure. Uh, so how does one get genotype 3 living here in America in a non-endemic region? Well, it's related to food, and it's related to this gastro-elitism movement, among other things. Uh, we'll eat anything now. Uh, wild boar, pappardelle, uh, pappardelle, pig's feet, Milanese, you, you name it, it's served in some restaurant somewhere. Um, this picture is of Ficatelli which is a raw pork sausage. It's incredibly popular in France, uh, southern France particularly. Toulouse, uh, France, has the highest prevalence of hepatitis E virus uh, 
and it's due to eating this frigatelli, uh, it's just air dried. I learned from a, a colleague in the Netherlands that they love to eat seared pork liver. Uh, so un, not cooked, just seared like a, like a tuna. Um, scrapple, which is popular in the U.S., uh, is made from pig's heads and pig's liver. Uh, fortunately, it's usually, usually cooked, uh, and then heating will kill this. Uh, liver slime from pig feces is then pooled and used to irrigate soil and plants around, around pig farms. So don't forget to eat your veggies. Uh, this, this struck me, 11% of raw pig liver sold in the giant or any other U.S. market test positive for HEV RNA. Uh, so if you take that liver home and don't cook it, you can have a good chance of getting hepatitis E. There's uh, another thing, what about, uh, this is d dirty water, if you would. Uh, you want to clean that water up, so let's say dirty water with viruses, you want to clean it up? Stick a clam in the water. Uh, these clams are tremendous sieves, as are oysters, and so raw seafood, raw shellfish, uh, could potentially uh, transmit this. Um, so is this disease uh, in the U.S.? Uh, we know the antibodies in the U.S. We know about the pe people getting sick. Well, this 154 cases of clinical hepatitis, non-A, non-B, non-C, were sent to the CDC. Uh, and uh, 26 or, uh, patients were found to be HEV infected. 11 of those 26 had traveled to endemic areas, so it wasn't surprising. But 15 were non-travelers with hepatitis E, uh, so-called autochthonous infection. And they were all genotype 3, and they were mostly in organ transplants. When have we gone? Jesus. Uh, so there's been a paradigm shift in our perception of hepatitis E. Um, we previously thought it to be a self-limited uh, infection, but now there's multiple cases of chronic infection been reported in liver, kidney, and other transplant recipients, patients with lymphoma on uh, rituximab and in HIV AIDS. The common denominator in those who get chronic hepatitis E is immunosuppression. Uh, almost all of these cases represent genotype 3 uh, in non-endemic regions. There can be a persistent viremia with reasonably high titers. They can go to cirrhosis very rapidly uh, and very often, uh, and it can occur in two to five years in these transplant recipients. And there are rare cases what's called of acute liver failure, acute fulminant liver failure, uh, and most of these cases of very severe hepatitis E, acute hepatitis E, uh, are called acute on chronic. They're HEV infections superimposed on people who already have uh, HPV or HCV, uh, chronic liver disease. Uh, can it be blood transmitted? This is a current dilemma for us. This is a single case from Japan. In yellow are the bilirubin levels. In red, the ALT levels. This is an acute, severe case of uh, hepatitis occurring after a blood transfusion. They called back the donor, uh, the donors to that case. Uh, only one was uh, in involved. This donor, prior to donation or previous donation, uh, had normal ALT, was negative for HEV RNA, had no antibody. At the time of the donation, from a saved sample, uh, the donor was positive for HEV RNA. Uh, negative for antibody. Later on, seroconverted for antibody, lost the virus. They then did uh, sequence identity. The, the HEV in the donor was identical to the HEV in the recipient. There have now been at least six cases like this, very well-documented cases, so there's no doubt it is transfusion transmitted. Skip that. Uh, the prevalence of the uh, of viremia in U.S. blood donors or, or worldwide uh, healthy subjects, uh, ranges between one in uh, roughly 3,000 to one in 14,000. In the latest uh, study on the bottom of the Red Cross, U.S. blood donors, about one in 9,000 donors is HEV RNA positive. Now, it's not a huge number, but it's not a small number either. Uh, uh, so uh, should we be testing for HEV in the blood supply? It fits all the criteria for testability. There, there is an asymptomatic viremia. 
Uh, there's significant clinical disease in immunosuppressed patients, uh, which at NIH are most of the patients. Uh, there's proven transfusion transmission. Uh, so if you had an average of 0.1% of donors with HEV RNA, and 14 million donations in the country, that might account for 1,400 HEV transmissions uh, per year in the U.S. So should we test or not? This is under debate right now. We have not yet begun testing. And there are no good standard commercial assays uh, available that have been FDA licensed. I'm going to skip this. But there is a vaccine for hepatitis E that is found in, in uh, only in China right now. So this is a sweet little pig, but it's causing us a lot of trouble. Uh, and so just remember that swine are not benign. Cook well before you die. So I want to jump now uh, to uh, a transfusion study in hepatitis C. Uh, in 1960s, Bob Purcell and Paul Holland and, and, uh, and Paul Schmidt began a prospective study of uh, open heart surgery patients in which the beauty of was frequent collections and recipients, stored donor samples, and then following patients for ALT elevations because that's all we could do uh, in the 1960s and, and early 70s. Um, I took over the study around 1970. And what we found, what had been found, is prior to 1970, um, that the rates of hepatitis in these open heart surgery patients were 28% and then 33%, a huge, huge number. And John Walsh, working with Bob Purcell, showed that the reason for this high rate was the source of the donor blood that if you received at least one unit of paid donor blood, you had a 51% chance of getting hepatitis. If you received only volunteer donor blood, it was only 7%. At this point, uh, Paul Schmidt and Paul Holland and myself decided to, we couldn't tolerate this anymore. We introduced an all-volunteer donor system and the first-generation test for hepatitis B surface antigen. This caused a precipitous fall in hepatitis to about 10%. And nothing we've ever done since that time has been as impactful as just changing the, so the source of the donor supply. In, uh, Abbott developed a sensitive third-generation test for surface antigen in 1973. We went back to stored samples and showed that HBV accounted for only about 25 to 30 percent of the total hepatitis, and there was some other non-B entity around. And then in 1975, Feinstone, Kapikin, and Purcell, uh, using this old Siemens microscope that is still in Building 50, uh, uh, used immune electron microscopy and found the hepatitis A virus. Uh, we then uh, immediately went into these non-B samples, testing for hepatitis A, and not a single one uh, was uh, hepatitis A positive. You know, we only had two known viruses, A and B. So it was then, in some brilliant deductive reasoning, I don't know if it was Bob's brilliant reasoning on my own, we said if these cases were not A and not B, we'd call them non-A, non-B. So that was the evolution of non-A, non-B hepatitis. Uh, but Bob was cautious. He said, you know, we don't yet have not proven it's a virus, and if it is, we don't know how many strains, uh, how many different viruses there might be. So. We now had non-A, non-B, so the next step was to inoculate chimpanzees. Uh, people, we can't do this anymore, and people worry about using chimpanzees, uh, but in point of fact, uh, they love being in our study. This is, they lined up to sign their informed consents, and, and we were able to show that we could transmit hepatitis from <coughs> asymptomatic people who had chronic hepatitis, as well as those who had acute hepatitis, and from asymptomatic donors who had been implicated in hepatitis transmission. So we had proved transmissibility, assumed it was a virus. Uh, and then came a very important patient, Mr. H, who is now deceased, but we followed him for over 30 years uh, after he got non-A, non-B hepatitis. Uh, he was up on that mountain. Uh, he was a trailblazer. And he liked to go and climb mountains and blaze trails. Uh, on this particular trip, or some other trip like it, 
he passed out while on the mountain. This is the case history one. <laughs> he passed out. Uh, his wife was with him, and luckily she was able to resuscitate him. Uh, he got back to NIH. He got to NIH. He had a triple coronary bypass. Uh, and then we entered him in our study. And six weeks after the bypass, he started to get ALT elevation shown here in the blue. Went up to 2,000. Normal level is about 40. Uh, went up to 2,000. He had jaundice. He was quite sick. Retrospectively, we could go back and show that he had uh, HCV RNA at a level of three times uh, 10 to the 7. Uh, Bob took this and put it into chimps. I'm not showing that data, but he titered the material in the chimp. It was about uh, one times uh, 10 to the 6.5, almost the same infectivity titer in the chimp as in the human. And that material was then vialed up and used in other experiments. Uh, and then Steve Feinstone took the, so now you had, you had a titer inoculum, you had a chimp model. So then you could do things to the inoculum. So Steve Feinstone did a coroform extraction uh, experiment uh, and showed that uh, if you extracted this uh, Hutchinson material, patient H, it didn't cause hepatitis. If you did a sham extraction, it caused it. This was very important. It showed that there was a central lipid in the membrane of the virus, and it, it narrowed the classification down. Then other studies were to size it using, again, using uh, H uh, material and filters, and then the chimp model. So in the end, we could deduce that the virus was small, 30 to 60 nanometers. It was lipid encapsidated. And that narrowed it down to being either these small RNA viruses, alpha and flavor viruses, or a hepatitis B-like virus. Uh, uh, we had a lot of evidence it wasn't in the hepatitis B family or the Delta family. So it's either going to be a new virus or an old virus, or an alpha virus or flavor virus. It proved, turned out to be a flavor virus a small RNA virus. Now, I guess, uh, one important thing was missing, because people thought maybe non-A, non-B was just a, a benign transaminitis. Uh, but we, working with the liver group here, we showed among 39 patients that 10 percent already had cirrhosis, 13 percent had severe chronic active hepatitis. As we follow them, we repeat biopsies. Some of them progressed. Three died of liver failure. Three had severe liver disease when they died of something else. So we now know that non-A, non-B was a very serious disease, uh, but we didn't know what it was. Still had no test, uh, no observation of the virus. Uh, and then, well, this was just a, a side thing again. There were, we were looking at other questions at the same time, and it's other unponderable things, such as, do infants have as much fun in infancy as adults do in adultery? Uh, we, we still haven't answered this, but we think we know, we know the answer. In any case, getting back to this study, when, when, how are we doing on time here? How's the time? OK. Um, so this is the rest of the transfusion story. We've gone through that. I won't go through this. But gradually, our rates came down in 1989 to about 4.1%. And at that point, uh, I. Uh, uh, we knew now the clinical severity, it was evident, we knew, but there was no serologic test, enzymatic test, we tried everything. Uh, and uh, we just could not get it, because molecular biology was just coming in at that, at that point. And our early attempts with Steve Feinstone hadn't yet worked. Uh, when uh, I wrote a poem in frustration, uh, which I forgot to bring with me, but it, was something like, I think that I shall never see this virus called non-A, non-B, a virus I cannot deliver, and yet I know it's in the liver. Oh, great liver in the sky, show us where and tell us why. Send us thoughts that will inspire us. If we don't publish soon, they're going to fire us. <laughs> I think this poem had, it was a little bit longer, but I can't remember it all. Uh, this poem had a great influence on Michael Houghton and the Chiron Corporation, because right after I wrote that, they cloned the virus. Uh, they took serum from a, uh, a uh, well-pedigreed chimpanzee that Dan Bradley had given them. They extracted DNA and RNA, but RNA turned out to be important. 
And they reverse transcribed it to cDNA. They cut it up, put it into an expression vector, FOS, GT11 expression vector, infected E. coli, <coughs> then lysed the E. coli, put on filter paper, and then made the assumption, although we'd never found an antibody, they made the assumption that people who had convalesced from this disease would have antibody, or who were chronic would have antibody. Uh, they went through six million clones, is the story, before they found a single reactive clone. And then they were able to reamplify that, eventually uh, walk the genome, describe the virus, develop an antibody test. They then came to me uh, to test a panel that I developed a uh, coded panel that had already debunked 19 previous claims of a non-A, non-B agent. And the Chiron Corporation broke the code perfectly. These were small panel, but they were, every sample was in duplicate in random positions. They detected the three chronic carriers in six different positions, two implicated donors in four different samples. Uh, they missed two acute phase uh, samples uh, because they hadn't yet developed antibody. This was an antibody assay, but they picked them up later on. And importantly, seven controls were negative in 14 different uh, samples. Uh, and that's where all the other groups had failed. Uh, we then looked at 15 of our best non-A, non-B cases, every one of them seroconverted for antibody uh, before, during the course of their hepatitis. And then we looked at donors to 25 cases, we found a positive donor in 80 percent uh, by a first generation, 88 percent by a second generation test. So we predicted we could, if we introduced this test, we could drop hepatitis rates by 90 percent. Indeed, that's what happened. The test was introduced in 1990, made better in 92, and we eventually reached zero incidence uh, by 1997. Now that's. It's probably it's not really zero, but the calculation on is about a chance, about one in two million chance of getting hepatitis from a transfusion compared to one in three when this began. Uh, we could estimate that prior to this test, that maybe 4.8 million people were infected with hepatitis C by blood transfusion in the two decades from 1970 to 1990, and that after testing was introduced that 2.4 million cases were prevented because we were testing in the 1990s and the 2000s up through today. These are just estimates, but uh, they're not way off. So I just want you to know that uh, you know we government workers uh, get a bum rap for being lazy. Uh, but I, I just want you to know that I at least give 100% at work. It's just that it has this peculiar distribution. <laughs> So today is one of my pretty pretty good days. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna erase. The, can somebody tell me the time? Uh, five after. Okay, five minutes. I'll be done. So uh, I just hepatitis C becomes chronic in the majority of people, and it becomes chronic because the virus ramps up very rapidly. So by the time this is when the hepatitis go, by the time the T cells. Uh, get activated, they have to face a huge mass of, of virus and viral proteins, and they become uh, blunted. So here's somebody who's recovered from hepatitis C by LE spot. They make good immune responses uh, to CD4, CD8, but if you have chronic hepatitis C, no immune response. Uh, no different than people who've never been exposed. The T cells just don't work against this virus, even though they're working against everything else. Also, this is a slide from Patricia Farsi, uh, one of my close collaborators, where we took that Mr. H, and she cloned 105 clones from him. 57% of them were identical. But at the same time, there were 19 other uh, variants of hepatitis C present in his serum on that given day. And if she'd done 1,000 clones, it would have been even more. So even if your antibody response was very effective against that predominant strain, any one of these were already there to take over. So clinically, hepatitis C, the majority of people have this long, stable course. They do quite well over decades and decades. But 20 to 30% get cirrhosis in 15 to 40 years. 
and 5% or less get cirrhosis very rapidly. Uh, I think these are patients who also have maybe a worse virus, but also have confounders such as alcohol or other hepatitis infections, although in our, our series, not hepatitis. But the thing nowadays that's a problem is obesity. The, uh, uh, and uh, the bad thing to have now is hepatitis virus plus obesity, uh, liver fat steatosis, you can see if you have hepatitis C alone, you have 16% have significant fibrosis. If you have that plus steatosis, it doubles. And if you have full-blown NASH, which is steatosis, plus the metabolic syndrome, it goes way up. So obesity now is a major confounder for liver disease. And just to show you how bad the epidemic is in the US, uh, this is a picture of the Statue of David on loan from Italy when he went back to Italy this is what David looked like. This, uh, this is uh, <laughs> okay. I, I'm going to have to skip this for sense of time, but just to say that Japan has a tenfold, eight to tenfold increase uh, incidence of liver cancer compared to the U.S., and they have it in older people. Uh, the curves in Japan are different from U.S., and they've always said you have the same incidence as we have. You're just about 30 years behind us. And that is proving to be the case when you look at carcinoma rates in the US from the late 80s, late 70s to the late 90s. The rates have gone up threefold. It's all due to hepatitis C. And it's been said that if, if there's no change in the standard of care, we're going to have a quadrupling of cancer and liver decompensation. And that was beginning to happen. But there has been a change in care now. We now have incredible treatments, uh, which have gone up the so-called direct-acting antivirals, uh, where we can cure greater than 90% of patients with hepatitis C. Uh, they're incredible drugs. They're, they have very little side effects. You take a pill for 12 weeks, and you're cured. Uh, but there's some economics involved with this. Uh, even though we can cure them, the cost of treatment is 50000 to 85000 per treatment. Uh, cost analysis shows this to be cost effective because the costs of transplantation and cirrhosis later on and liver failure are quite high. But up front, it's a tremendous cost. It costs to, to cure the 3.2 million carriers in the U.S. at the lower rate of 50000 it cost $160 billion, about 10% of the uh, total uh, Health care budget. So it jeopardized Medicare, jeopardized other treatment programs. So is this high cost justified because of the pharmaceutical investment, because we're a capitalistic society, we owe it to our, our stockholders, or is this usury? And this is being now debated for uh, all kinds of blockbuster drugs that, that seem to be coming out. Uh, so I don't know the answer. Uh, so this is the final slide to uh, just show what's happened in these decades. We've identified HPV, HAV, hepatitis delta virus, HEV, non-A, non-B, HCV. Established a strong link between three of these viruses and hepatocellular carcinoma. We developed vaccines for HPV, HAV, and HEV. We had a virtual eradication of post-transfusion hepatitis. Successful transplantation for cancer and end-stage liver disease, highly effective immunosuppression for HBV, greater than 90% cure rates for HCV. Is it possible or even likely uh, that we can eradicate viral hepatitis, uh, at least in the developed world, the next three to five decades? I don't know the answer. That's going to have to come from the young people in the audience, because I have a new philosophy of life with age, uh, new perspective. Uh, where age is on the uh, abscissa, and the ordinate is give a damn, and I'm right here. So <laughs> I don't give a damn, but somebody in this audience will, will, will figure this out. Thank you. I'm sorry to go over, but I started late. Well, <clears throat> I think given the hour, we'll hold any questions till after John's talk. But, you know, thank you, Harvey, for an incredible uh, 
review of an amazing field in which uh, this institution and you have played such an important part. So John, where do viruses come from? Um, some years ago, I was sharing a beer with, with an old friend of mine, Butler Schaffner. Some of you may know he is. He's a fairly well-known molecular biologist and former colleague and friend. And he looked at me and he said, John, if you had one question you could ask of God, what would it be? And my answer was, where do viruses come from? The very question that you just asked me. Um, I've been asking that question over and over again. You know, I don't have an answer yet, actually. So. You can ask, but there's certainly no guarantee that you'll ever get an answer. Um, so, let's see, where are we here? Where do I? Wait a minute. Oh. You open. <laughs> oh, you open the magic drawer. And this and is you what hit, you use. Hit that. Hit, hit this somehow, and then you get that, and. Let's try that. Okay. All right. There we are. Is that you? This no. is me here. I think. I think I called it demystifying. Boy, that sense of that's amazing. <laughs> there we are. So, um, actually, I think my next slide. Um, I'm going to spend much more, well, more time sort of talking about the second one of these than the first, but I'm really only going to talk about one group of viruses. It won't surprise many of you to hear, and that's retroviruses. Um, and I'm not going to talk about uh, viruses that cause any known disease uh, for the purposes of this talk, but we're trying to, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about virus hunting, but on a very different scale about it. Uh, 5,000-fold uh, enhanced scale over the time frame that, that you just heard about from Dr. Alder. Um, so, um, so actually, I don't have a clue where viruses come from, and so we can get rid of this very quickly. But I will, uh, I have a little cartoon that I drew that, that sort of summarizes, actually what, what Wynn summarized very nicely at, 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 in his introduction, and that is that this just shows a, a very simplified picture of the way evolution must have occurred. Okay, so whatever, whatever more complicated steps there were in evolution, it, it almost certainly has to have included these, these events, which is going, starting with, a, with an RNA world in which you had some kind of self-replicating molecules of RNA that managed to gather things from whatever the primordial soup was, put them together to make self-replicating molecules. Somehow this gets surrounded by probably some kind of a membrane to make a vesicle so you can, you can link genotype and phenotype together. And then, and then there's the invention of, of, of ribosomes and all kinds of other things, but ribosomes are really the key invention here, it's allowing one to make proteins, um, which are, they were probably originally all RNA as well. Then finally, there's the invention of DNA into some kind of a protocell and ancestral cell, and that gets very fairly early on divided into prokaryotes like these beautiful colored bacteria I found online, and then uh, into eukaryotes, and then eventually to uh, much more complex organisms. And so that's, that's the process of evolution. That's all you need to know about evolution. Um, except that there had to have been um, both various kinds of molecular events to cause the changes that you need, uh, mutations, if you like, going along, and also um, important, uh, everything had to have been selected for because it did a little better, at least, than, than, than the thing that preceded it. So along the way here, somewhere viruses arose, as, as uh, Wynn pointed out. And so they could have arisen uh, as sort of direct descendants from the RNA world. And there are a few viruses, if you like, that are nothing but RNA molecules that we know about. Um, or they could have arisen from these, these kinds of structures. They could have arisen from these cells. They could have become, they could have been things that evolved intracellularly into information chain, exchanging um, agents, entities that eventually managed to break free so they could go back from cell to cell. It could be any of these things, um, but it's probably nowhere near that simple. Um, it, things were probably went back and forth and back and forth. We know for, perfectly well, for example, that many viruses have um, 
picked up genes from their cell and uh, from the cells that they infect and incorporated them into their own genotype. But on the other hand, there are genes and viruses that have no no recognizable relationship structurally even um, to uh, to sequences in cells and may may come from some kind of entity that no longer exists, like these original RNA, self-replicating RNA molecules and so on. All of these are probably, if they exist, nobody's managed to find them yet. Um, <coughs> so this is kind of where RNA viruses come from. The important thing all, in all along here, though, is to consider what, what are the selective events that occurred. It, evolution is very, very long. Um, you can't uh, use Occam's razor to, to help you with your arguments. It, it's a much more complicated philosophy than that because uh, the difference between something that takes a million steps to occur and something that takes a million and one steps to occur is pretty small. Um, so why do they do what they do? And the simple answer to that is because they can. Um, and um, like some old jokes, actually. Um, <clears throat> However they arose, virus, viruses have evolved multiple times into a variety of niches and probably by a variety, of, a very large variety of different mechanisms. Viruses all share the property that they have, they exist in two phases, a virion, which is an extracellular phase that, whose job is to transmit information from one cell to another, and an intracellular phase where usually the virion is, is pretty much gone, leaving behind only the nucleic acids or some substructures. Um, they rely on cells for all their, most or all of their replicative functions, except in a few cases for some rather simple enzymatic machinery. The virion allows cell to cell and host, uh, the virion allows cell to cell and host cell, host to host transmission, so it protects the genetic information as you go along. Um, the job of a virus, uh, if, you, if you like, that, it, that it's evolved to do is only to make more of itself or to tell a cell to make more of itself. Everything else a virus does um, is just um, uh, either a side effect, such as men causing disease. The, 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 uh, the fact that HIV, for example, causes a serious disease in humans is just an accident. It's that, that this virus actually doesn't cause a serious disease in the virus in its natural host. Um, but when it gets into another host, it does. And I'll have a nice cartoon to show you on that a little bit later. <coughs> in general, uh, Long-term host virus coevolution co often leads to a well-adapted, relatively benign interaction. Um, the only exception to this benignness is that, as I hear people sneezing and coughing in the audience, the, if, that, if, if the pathogenesis of the virus aids its transmission from one host to another, then it can. Um, and and there, this is fairly obvious, of course, if the virus causes you to to spew it all over the place into sewage, then that helps its own transmission, and that's an adaptive feature for the virus. By and large, interactions like that, like sneezing and coughing and viruses that do this, uh, tend the, the, the interaction on the whole is still relatively benign. You don't usually die of that kind of infection. <coughs> and, um, uh, but we don't know that much about this because the old, the old saying used to be, when I was a student, that, that viruses don't leave behind a fossil record. There are no fossil viruses, and the best you can do is the sort of 2,000-year time frame um, uh, based on historical records and perhaps mummies and things like that that people have looked at to find evidence for virus infections. However, retroviruses, as I, you're probably aware, um, in fact, have left behind a very substantial fossil record, and we, uh, we carry it around with us, and that's mostly what I want to talk about, is what we can learn from this sort of uh, evolution, uh, um, uh, about evolution from the fossil record that, that we and all other animals carry. I'll just point, use this slide uh, to point out that retroviruses, as I'm sure you're probably all aware, but they, repl they replicate, um, infect cells, they have an RNA genome, that RNA genome gets trans, uh, tr uh, copied into the DNA molecule. The important step in char defining character, actually hepatitis B viruses also uh, have uh, used the same kind of process for their replication, but the important thing about retroviruses is, is that they require that there be a step in which the, the, the DNA genome gets um, covalently, the DNA copy of the RNA genome gets covalently bound, uh, integrated into cell DNA, uh, this integration for all the viruses that we've looked at is not a very specific event. It's in the sense that um, 
there are millions probably of possible integration targets within a cell, and that's a very useful feature for studying actually also HIV, but it's also for studying the endogenous viruses I'm going to talk about. The other thing about retroviruses that's important to keep in mind is that they, they're very intimately uh, connected to the host cell machinery. Most of their replication is carried out by the host cell machinery. Once you have an integrated provirus, that cell, as that cell replicates uh, and divides, <coughs> this provirus will be divided with it. Um, there's no mechanism by, by which these proviruses are spe can be specifically lost. And um, so the replication can be by the host cell's division machinery. Uh, many retroviruses interaction is completely benign relative to the cell. So, um, so the cell doesn't die as a result, can dot divide and, and keep, keep spread the virus that way. And the virus is also transcribed, translated. Um, entirely, uh, pretty much entirely by host cell machinery as well. So this is a very intimate association that these viruses have evolved, uh, more so uh, than almost all other viruses that we know. So retroviruses can be divided into a, a family tree into what we now uh, refer to taxonomically as genera. Um, and <coughs> um, uh, so, uh, named um, rather uh, cleverly alpha, beta, gamma, epsilon, delta, and so on. Uh, uh, HIV belongs to this group called lentiviruses. So um, when people started to first generate these sequences, particularly uh, of HIV-1 and, and a related virus, HIV-2, uh, this got, evolutionary biologists got a hold of this data and they applied uh, sort of the standard evolutionary tech biology analyses of the time, largely what's largely referred to as neutral theory, which is a brilliant theory that works very, very well for looking at organisms like flies or people or mice and, their, and figuring out their evolutionary processes. When they did that, it was estimated that these two viruses diverged from one another about 200 years ago and that the root of this tree separating all viruses was some retroviruses was something like 2,000 years ago. Well, this, um, however, um, this, or, this, this time frame that was put on this evolution, in fact, uh, was off by four or five orders of magnitude, I would say, which is a large error even for evolutionary biology. Um, in fact, the, the root of, all, of this tree is probably um, somewhere between 100 million and a billion years ago, if not more. Uh, retroviruses are very old, and we know that because there's a point, I think actually, so this virus, HERV-K, is, is a group of viruses I'll talk about um, um, in, in a few minutes. But we know that this point right here has to be at least 30 million years ago. And we know that because there are proviruses. This, is an endo this virus is known only as an endogenous virus. There are proviruses that are where this virus is still distinct from this, the, the lineage that gives rise to this virus that are found integrated in exactly the same place in the genomes of us and all other old world primates meaning that virus must have been in the common ancestor of us, baboons, uh, African greens, every other kind of, of, of uh, old world primate that we know. And that means that the ancestor that gave rise to this must have existed about th something on the order of 30 million years ago. And this, this whole, uh, this whole uh, tree probably is at least 10 times that, if not, uh, if not a great deal more. So we really don't know. Um, and, and these are not sort of ancestral viruses, ancestors to viruses. These are modern. These look like modern viruses when you figure out what these look like. Um, there has been retrovirus evolution was over a very long time ago in terms of giving rise to all of the modern virus, all of the viruses that we can detect these today. Uh, so if you could go to pieces of amber, pull out dinosaur blood, I'm sure you would find actually very modern-looking retroviruses in the DNA of, 
of very old uh, ancient organisms. So endogenous retroviruses are remnants of germline infection by retroviruses. They can sometimes become fixed in the host species, sometimes just by chance, just because mutations by chance get fixed occasionally. That's the way evolution works in part. And sometimes because they have a, give a selective advantage by, for example, conferring protection against future infections by the same or similar viruses. If a retrovirus needs to interact, for example, with a very specific cell molecule like a receptor, having that to, in order to infect uh, an individual, having uh, that same retrovirus in the germline, perhaps mutated in ways that it can no longer cause disease, but it can still tie up that, re that protein and prevent infection by the same virus coming outside. And that's actually been a fairly important mechanism, probably in, in the host virus arms races as referred to. And some, there are some salutary effects I'll show you. Or a slide of it in a minute. Uh, they're inherited like normal genes. There's nothing special about them uh, except their structure uh, helps, helps you to make some interesting evolutionary inferences I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, they're present in every vertebrate and many, if not all, invertebrates where they've been looked for. Uh, they comprise a large chunk of our DNA, something like 6 to 8% of the human genome is bits and pieces of DNA that were originally retroviruses that infected are very distant, um, in a few cases, fairly recent ancestors. Um, as compared to the total coding information in our DNA, there's more viruses in us than there is us in us. Um, <coughs> so this is actually not an insignificant part of our evolutionary history. Um, they provide a fossil record of pathogen interaction that's unavailable in any other system. That's actually a little bit exaggerated because there are a few DNA copies of other viruses that found their way into our germline over the, uh, over the last uh, uh, 10, 20, 10, 20 million years or more, um, because as, as pseudogenes that, that were created by um, a, a rather chance process using another retro element that I'm not going to talk about, but there are only a few of those. There, there are very large numbers of different types of retroviruses, most of which are extinct. In fact, they're all, all the ones in humans are essentially extinct as infectious agents as far as we know. So this gives us, it's like looking at trilobites and things like that, except they're, they, they're more similar to us, um, to the current viruses than are some of the ancient uh, sort of stone fossils that you can see. In some animal models, uh, these are causing disease. In humans, as far as we know, there's no disease associated. This is actually something that we're still looking at with the one virus I'm going to talk about in a minute. So endogenous viruses are simply formed by infection of a uh, germ, a germline cell, a precursor or a sperm or an egg cell, usually an ovum in the models that have been, people have studied, and or a precursor to it. And um, the um, that then creates a provirus, which has these characteristic long-term repeats at the end. Um, and that then um, can become a, uh, a fertilized zygote. And that is then this provirus is now present in all of the cells, all of the cells in the organism that originally derives from it. And if this individual goes on to have descendants, then it will be present in all, well, half of the descendants as, a, as it segregates and can, as I said, it occasionally become fixed in the population. So, as I mentioned, the host virus evolutionary process, usually the end point of that is usually a benign relationship, relatively benign relationship. Uh, we carry a lot of viruses around with us all the time, actually, without ever showing any symptoms or having shown fairly mild symptoms that we recover from, for example, epstein barr virus. Um, most of us are infected with that. There are any number of other DNA viruses that most of us are already infected with. And that's the end product. That's probably the end product of a rather long evolutionary process um, in which we don't want to participate, by the way. Uh, because when you get transmission of this virus to another species, uh, which happens rarely because there are quite a few barriers to that happening, but when it does happen, the result is often uh, that this benign virus in this species is, is quite virulent in this species, and this may well be where things like hepatitis viruses, some of them may have come from other species in which, in which they evolved where you can't even find them. 
by and large because they don't cause, they don't cause symptoms, so it's hard to look for them. Um, and this kind of cross-species, rare cross-species transmission event um, has uh, led to uh, considerable morbidity and mortality. This eventually, eventually there's this evolutionary process, I, as I say, in which you don't want to participate because you're not likely to be this guy, you're much more likely to be this guy. Um, either leads to reestablishment of another benign relationship or the virus wins and the, the population gets, it gets wiped out or the host wins and the virus gets eliminated. Um, all of these outcomes are, are likely, um, but, <coughs> the, um, uh, but reestablishment of this sort of a benign relationship is good and then when the virus gets transmitted onto another species, uh, you'll get the same process starting all over again. And this actually is very much a, a pretty good description of how HIV arose. Um, and um, eventually, you'll probably, again, reestablish some sort of a benign relationship. If we also, unless, unless even worse things happen, it's unlikely we're going to shake this infection off altogether. Um, but again, you don't want to be a part of that process. It's a good idea to avoid getting infected. Uh, with retroviruses, the process can be somewhat different. Uh, you can have the same kind of thing happening, um, but you can also have the formation of endogenous proviruses, which either through the same kind of process where the host adapts, or because the endogenous provirus itself helps the host to adapt and shake off the infection because it makes this host resistant, um, then... Um, the virus can be long gone, but can survive uh, again to go on and give us a fossil record of an infection that happened in some very distant ancestor. And these endogenous proviruses can have both good and bad effects. This is the case of a virus called mouse mammary tumor virus, which is common in some inbred strains of mice. That virus, if it escapes, if it starts to replicate in this animal, can actually cause a um, a mammary carcinoma, which will kill this animal because the virus occasionally, as it's replicating, integration sites can be all over the place, but they can occasionally be adjacent to a proto-oncogene. You can turn on the expression of this proto-oncogene, and that can give rise um, to a mammary carcinoma in this animal. Another endogenous virus is that actually we discovered in the lab some years ago. Um, sits in the middle of a gene called HR in the homozygous state if this provirus is present. This mouse, um, which actually had hair uh, when it was very young, but after the first hair growth cycle, it lost it. This is its sibling that's heterozygous for this provirus. Um, and uh, that, but these, so these virus, pro, endogenous viruses can cause these kinds of mutations. Proviruses like this are probably fairly rapidly weeded from the population by selection. This one happened to be spotted by a night watchman in an aviary in London who saw this rather odd-looking mice running, mouse running across the floor. It was a mouse, happened to be a mouse fancier, so he caught this mouse and went back and, and uh, bred out the gene into laboratory strain mice, and the rest is history in that respect. We managed to identify the, the, the managed to clone this provirus and its gene by um, by going to Australia, where they breed very large numbers of these mice to use, test them, use them for obvious reasons for testing sunscreens, actually, and uh, the uh, and found by chance a mouse that had uh, uh, what was the offspring of uh, two two parents who looked like this, um, but the, that mouse looked like that, and that's because this provirus had gone away, leaving behind. A, a, leaving behind a solo LTR, this repeat structure at the end, was lost by recombination between these homologous sequences. The solo LTR in this gene did not have the phenotypic effect that the full-length provirus did, and we were actually able to prove that this, um, prove genetically that this, pro this virus actually was causing this mutation. Um, the endogenous proviruses have also had good effects. For example, there's a provirus in all of us that sits next to a copy of a, of a gene for Amylase, amylase is ordinarily expressed only in the pancreas uh, for digestive purposes. However, in humans and a few other higher primates, chimpanzees, there's a, uh, a copy of this gene um, that has a provirus sitting next to it. That provirus now has a, the LTR, the long-term repeat, contains uh, transcriptional activator sequences. This is actually one that's um, 
active in salivary glands, turns on the expression of this gene in the salivary glands. That has the effect of making starchy foods taste slightly sweet and may have a lot to do with our penchant for growing uh, starchy foods, grains, and, wheat, and so on. Uh, finally, there's a provirus uh, with an envelope gene that's expressed, and this has happened actually in many different lineage, many different orders of mammals. Of, uh, different viruses have come into the germline with this gene that's expressed in placental tissue, specifically in the trophoblast layer. This is the envelope gene, which is the gene that fuses virions, interacts with receptors, fuses virions into cells. This actually causes the fusion of cells in the trophoblast layer into the structure called the syncytia trophoblast, which is one, one giant cell that surrounds the whole placenta, uh, fetal placenta, and um, is very important for blocking diffusion of passive diffusion of toxins and things from the maternal to the fetal circulation. It's probably had a lot to do with um, increasing the complexity of mammals by allowing much longer gestation periods. Uh, in er very early mammalian evolution. And this has happened very many times, many, many times in the course of mammalian evolution. Completely different viruses end up doing the same thing. And so endogenous viruses have had a lot to do with what we are. Um, and uh, so we're, I, I'll ta tell you a little bit about how we've been using uh, endogenous pro proviruses to probe evolution in different primates. This is my, one of my favorite primates who is doing these studies, Jen Hughes, who did a lot of the early analysis as a student in my lab a few years ago. So endogenous proviruses make very good evolutionary markers. They represent unique and irreversible mutations. And a shared insertion of provirus at the same site um, in, um, in two different species means that that provirus has to have derived from a common event that ha has to have happened in a common ancestor of these two species because integration sites are so, so scattered across the genome. So there are millions of possible sites. Um, so they can be used to provide important inf information like the estimating the time of integration by simply looking at the distribution of this specific virus in different species, and you can do that easily with PCR now. Or you can do it even, actually even more easily just by going to the computer and digging out, pulling out the sequences of the genomes of different species. <coughs> they can be used to detect and quantitate different ki various kinds of sort of oddball evolutionary events and, for, for example, different kinds of recombination events. So the group I'm going to talk about specifically is called HERV case. HERV is just human endogenous retrovirus K because it uses the lysine tRNA primer. Uh, for reverse transcription. HML2 stands for human mammary tumor virus, like this is a group that's most closely related to the virus that causes mammary carcinoma in mice and was first detected that way in hybridization experiments. Um, first entered the genome was something like 30 million years ago with successive waves of spread through our ancestors. Uh, we carry about 100 full-length proviruses in each of us as well as about 10 times that many um, uh, solo LTRs, which, as I said, are formed by a homologous recombination event that brings the two LTRs together, crosses over, this happens probably during meiosis, and then tosses out everything in the middle, but the solo LTR, this sequence is still left behind as a solo LTR. Um, they're expressed as transcripts and particles in certain normal tissues, for example, in placenta, as well as certain disease states in breast cancer, germ cell cancers is a very commonly to see expression of these, uh, something we're studying heavily in the lab, but I'm not going to, time, time prevents me from talking about this. Um, we found about 91, actually, more full length, just by mining the, 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 the current state of the human genome sequence, about 90 full length proviruses. Most of these are in everybody. We share exactly the same complement of them. A few are polymorphic in that I have a few that you don't and so on and so forth but not too many of those. These, these, however, are the interesting ones because these are the ones that have been inserted so recently that are not yet fixed um, in, in the population. So proviruses of this group first started entering um, something like 30 million years ago, and they have been entering the, our, our germline ever since up until, very, up until actually quite recently. Um, many have retained open reading frames, although not all of them, many of, well, actually the majority of them have various kinds of mutations that prevent them from being properly expressed. Um, as I said, they're insertional, some are insertionally polymorphic. Um, 
There could still be virus that's actually circulating that goes with these. We, we, don't, we can't say for certain that this is really extinct. Eventually, somebody, hopefully, maybe even us, um, may pull one of these out of the germline or pull one of these out from some other source, just like the coelacanth was pulled out from the ocean years uh, after it had been thought to be extinct for millions of years. Um, none of these proviruses, unlike the situation in mice and chickens and some other species, none of these proviruses is shown to be infectious as is. Um, and so, but are there still viruses that are still infecting humans? And we don't know that. But this is sort of how we're trying to address that issue or see if to, to, to look not for, not for a disease that goes with a, a virus, but see if there's a virus that's still around that could have the potential of causing some disease. <coughs> And so one of the things we can look at is what's going on in, the, in, the long, in these long terminal repeats, the LTRs that flank the ends of the provirus. They're about a kilobase in length. Um, and they're created during reverse transcription by co doubly copying part of the sequence of the viral RNA. So they start off being identical in sequence because of the way they're made. Um, but after they're integrated, um, they can, uh, uh, they, they, they can uh, begin to accumulate mutations. So, um, if you have so from the distribution of proviruses, you can also you can estimate the age as well. As I said, uh, this just shows a cartoon example. If there's a provirus that was integrated um, along in here, so it's at the common ancestor of these species, but not these old world monkey species, um, then you'll find it in these in this set of provir in this set of species. If there's one that's even older. Um, and they will be detectable by the identical integration site, and you can then easily find them now just by using PCR to amplify this specific provirus or by uh, just going to the database and looking to, to see if it's there, basically, in the, in the species of interest as more and more of these DNA sequences become available. And um, if, if you find in all of these species, then the provirus would it has to have been integrated into something way back when. And so we can date this one, for example, back to more than uh, 30 million years ago. So as I said, the LTRs, when integrated, must have be identical in sequences. But after that happens, over evolutionary time, mutations begin to accumulate. They accumulate fairly slowly, but over, these, over the millions of years we're talking about, you can get a pretty good signal to, to distinguish these. Then with time, you'll get speciation. The speciation will actually fix the, um, the mutations that have arisen at that point, and then new ones will start to arise. And so you can begin to develop what a, what, what a tree would look like if you put all, these two LTRs from all of these different species on the same tree. Then the mutations would accumulate, and you'd end up with a tree. It's little, these are kind of small, but you can see um, uh, humans, uh, chimpanzees, bonobos, uh, gorillas, and so on, and um, uh, gibbons, I think, or orangutans. Um, and you should see two identical sides of this tree that have uh, identical branching patterns. Um, any violet, so uh, this is what the phylogeny of the LTRs should look like. However, if something strange has happened in the course of evolution, like recombination between these two, to give rise to a gene conversion event, then that will violate this tree and you'll see a different kind of pattern. So here's something that looks correct. You see humans most closely related to chimpanzees and bonobos, then gorillas, then orangutans and gibbons, and you see the identical pattern to within experimental error on both sides of this tree, and then outgroups over here uh, have um, the show, show that different viruses are, are uh, relatively distantly related, and you can get this nice branching pattern. And this essentially confirms what we believe the pattern of evolution of all of these species to be. Um, however, if you, if you look at some others, you see that there are some strange, some strange things happen. Um, this, um, this group here uh, looks good. Um, but this group here actually looks rather strange with orangutans now sitting in the middle here. And um, what's happened here is that there has been some kind of a gene conversion event that in this lineage here has caused these two LTRs to become um, sort of scrambled with one another um, in a way 
that you can very sensitively detect by using it. So you can use this as a, as a sensitive detective method for oddball events and integration. Um, another thing you can look for is uh, sort of the distribution of these proviruses among different individuals. These are groups of DNAs that you can buy that have come from these different populations that are believed to be relatively pure populations of these, um, of these different uh, far-flung groups all over the world. And you can see that this particular provirus is easily detected by various kinds of PCR assays. I'm not going to go into it, but you can, you can see you can detect basically a full-length provirus by PCR from the outside into a middle to here somewhere. If you use two flanking primers, you can see the solo LTR or the empty site before the provirus has been inserted. And in this with this particular provirus, you can see all of these, these different things. Here's an empty site here, solo LTR here, full-length provirus here. And you can see that all of these populations uh, have evidence that this provirus, actually with the exception of this one, now that I look at it, um, have evidence that this provirus was um, was in there, so this must have integrated relatively recently, so it's still not completely fixed in the population, but long enough ago that it found its way be prior to human radiation to all of these different places in the world. And this, these include Africa, I believe Australia, uh, Asia, and South America. So this, um, these populations are all over the place. So the, before human radiation, this provirus came in, but not so recently that there's, not so long ago that there's not uh, still some individuals uh, who are at least heterozygous or perhaps even homozygous in this case uh, for this empty integration site. There's also been some solo LTR formation in here as well. And <coughs> so this is a, um, uh, basically a southern blot. Uh, some of you may remember so how to do southern blots. Uh, the younger ones probably don't. Um, Basically, basically taking DNA cutting with a restriction enzyme, running it on a gel, and then detecting um, these, these, these junction fragments which distinguish a provirus by its integration site with a specific probe that's out in here somewhere. So a small molecule probe has hybridized all these fragments on the gel. So each of these bands represents a specific provirus. As you can see, and this is, these are just Ten donors who happened to be walking through the lab at the wrong time when I had a phlebotomist there and a consent form um, ready to go. Uh, so I collect, as you know, and if you walk around your lab, um, this is a pretty good worldwide collection of people. Actually, usually, um, at, at least uh, um, there will be a number of continents uh, of ancestry represented there, and you can see that. Most everybody has pretty much the same pattern, pretty much the same set of provirus as I said before. But there are some obvious exceptions here. You can see that this, this, this individual is missing this one, for example. Um, the, this, there's a, a provirus here that's found in a few people, but not in everybody. There's another one here. Um, this individual in particular um, has a couple of proviruses that are not found in everybody. Um, obviously, uh, rules uh, are very strict about, re about um, revealing the identity of these different individuals. But in this case, actually, I can make a special exception to that. Um, and uh, ri giving rise to the hypothesis that maybe the more pr these proviruses you have, the more interested you are in virology. <laughs> uh, we're, still we're still trying to test that, uh, that idea. But in any case, um, there are, the point here is that there are proviruses that are in some individuals, not in others, indicating that they were, um, that the virus that gave rise to these was still around not too long ago. Uh, by not too long, I probably mean something in the 100,000 year range. Um, uh, but so we're, we're very interested then in seeing, so this, this just actually shows, obviously you can't see it, um, but this is a listing of all of the 90 or so proviruses that we, in fact, dug out of the human genome by data mined out of the human genome, and just shows that there's a lot of, they're all quite closely related to one another, except they differ a lot uh, by very frequent deletions. Many, most of these are, in fact, all but, all but one of these are, are, are visibly defective. You can actually tell by looking at them that this would not give rise to virus. There is one that looks quite intact. Um, and, I'm not sure exactly where it is here. 
Um, <coughs> but it, what we know is not infectious. It has some mutations that keep it from giving rise to infectious virus. But the question arises, are there any very proviruses that give rise to, might give rise to infectious virus? Well, if so, they're likely to be quite rare um, because it's likely that this virus is in some way pathogenic. And once the provirus is integrated, at least it may, it may spread a little bit in the population, uh, but will probably eventually be selected against. And so if it's going to be there, it's likely to be quite rare. So our, we were very interested in finding very rare proviruses. Um, fortunately, there, is, um, the, uh, uh, there, there are these big genome sequencing projects the so-called thousand genomes, which actually has collected over 2,500 sequences of, pop, from, of human genomes from populations worldwide. Um, so fortunately, there is this big database where, in principle, we could just go and look and see what there are for rare proviruses. Uh, unfortunately, the way the sequencing is done, which is alignment of very short sequencing reads <clears throat> to a reference genome, um, does not allow detection by standard means of these proviruses, they just get thrown out of, of the database. So the, 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 um, because they don't match oh, any such sequence that would be indication that there was a provirus sitting there would have some sequence that was related to the standard a lot reference sequence, <clears throat> but would have a piece of sequence that wasn't related to the reference sequence. The computer algorithms actually throw that away because it's not closely enough related to make a match. Um, but so that's unfortunate. But fortunately, they do get saved in a so-called non-aligned sequence, or what we call a dumpster file. And with the right kind of dumpster diving, you can actually go back and recover these uh, with a fair amount of effort, as it turns out. And so we actually have two strategies that we're using to recover these sequences. I'm not going to go into the details of them. Uh, this one is actually fairly, uh, fairly fast um, and relatively easy to set up on a computer, but it is um, is relatively insensitive. It requires that the provirus be present in a number of different sequences in order to be able to see it. This one is um, uh, sort of a, a more manual process. It's much more labor intensive, but you can probably pick up everything that's there. Um, so it's much more sensitive. So we've used both of these uh, together. This one actually not on the whole database. This one's been used on the whole database. This one only in about 600 sequences so far. And uh, one then uh, aligns the reads um, and uh, de determines what the flanking sequence is likely to be. And you'll get a lot of, with either of these, you get a lot of, of false hits. So you have to go back to the actual DNAs, which are also available from this, um, fr from these all 2,500 DNAs or are, are, can be purchased. And um, you can then go back with the same kinds of PCR assays to look and confirm that the provirus is actually present or it's present as a solo LTR, you can't tell from this, uh, or whether the pre-integration site is present. And so you can go back and, and, and then dig up the genome and see what you get. And this just shows the frequency of newly found proviruses that we detected this way. We found about 30 altogether. As expected from the bulk sequence, about where we about there was about a ten to one ratio of quote full length or proviruses that contain both LTRs to solo LTRs. All of, all of the ones that don't have an arrow here are in fact solo LTRs. So about thirty uh, solo LTRs compared to about four uh, compared to four full length proviruses, some of which are quite rare, allele frequency of less than one percent some of which are around a few percent, and then some of which are more common but were actually missed in the original, um, uh, were not present in the original individual or the very uh, the few first individuals that were, that were looked at this way. Um, and when we look at these, three out of these four are in fact uh, quite defective, uh, would obviously not give rise to infectious virus. However, the fourth one, uh, on, which is on the X chromosome, it's mostly, uh, most of the, this, we found this in I think about a half dozen genomes, most of them from Africa, or I think one is from Europe. Um, and um, this provirus, these, these vertical bands, 
indicate the difference from a known infectious sequence. I have to go back up a little bit. A couple of laboratories, not mine, unfortunately, although we were trying to do this experiment at the time that we actually read about it in a couple of journals from a couple of other labs, managed to reconstruct an infectious virus by recombining in the laboratory uh, three, I believe, three of the proviruses that are all of which are defective. Um, they recombine these to make, uh, by recon to reconstruct what looked like the common ancestor of these viruses and managed to make an infectious, weakly infectious virus. Um, and this just, the vertical lines here shows where, the, just a few sites, less than 1%, where our provirus sequence is different from the infectious one. So we have reason to hope, we're still actually looking to see if this, um, uh, so this looks good. This looks like it might be an infectious virus. Um, <coughs> it's rare in the population, and it's mostly geographically limited to Africa, uh, maybe even to a small region in Africa. That remains to be seen. But actually, that means that also, if you start looking in the United States, you'll almost certainly find it as well, just by looking in, at for, in, for individuals whose ancestry is, um, is in this region. Um, and... Um, and so that's, that's where we stand with this, actually. So we have, we have what might be a virus. It might be a very ancient virus that actually might still be around in the population. Now, that's right. And, um, and so we're still looking. So I'll just point out that this virus is expressed. Viruses of this type, of some of these proviruses are expressed at a high, high level in some tissues. In fact, also in normal, in normal placenta. Also an HIV-1 infection. Um, and um, there are um, ideas that with the expression in disease, um, this may actually give uh, both markers, useful markers for some disease, which is a possibility, but also that uh, targeting, uh, for example, epitopes encoded by these sequences may give some kind of, may give a useful therapy. I'm very suspicious of this, but it might in fact be a possibility, as might um, some kind of infection strategies. And people are at least proposing the idea of using infection uh, strategies to knock out these viruses to actually to, uh, against, um, for example, breast cancer um, and, and other diseases. We'll, that, that really remains to be seen. Um, and um, <coughs> uh, that's actually another example of the same thing. Uh, um, this virus has also been reported to be expressed at a very high level in the blood of HIV-infected patients. Um, and uh, so we've, we set out to uh, examine that in more detail. Actually, I'm not going to, for, for the sake of time, basically, when we, when we set up an assay uh, that, um, that excluded DNA in the blood, uh, that carefully excluded the presence of DNA, we actually couldn't find this virus anymore. And so we believe most of the signal that you saw that was seen originally and reported to be as virus was actually DNA that was coming from lice cells, which may be more prevalent in HIV-infected and uninfected individuals. Um, but um, uh, I'm, not, I'm actually not going to go into these. But I'll just say that the, the, the expression, the, the, another issue is that in HIV infection where there is an increased expression in cells, of, of these proviruses gives rise to the possibility that in cells or in cancers gives rise to the possibility that under the conditions where you're getting and increased expression, the same thing could happen that, hap that you can do in the lab, and that is you could get recombination between two or more of these to give rise to an infectious virus, and that's another issue that we are in fact. So, so it might be that this virus sort of gets resurrected every now and again by chance as a course of some kind of disease process like HIV infection or cancer, um, and we are, um, that would, a sign of that would be uh, new proviruses integrated into the DNA that you didn't see before, and we're looking specifically for these right now. And, um, and so retroviruses, this is sort of my last, almost my last slide. Retroviruses have uniquely left behind a rich fossil record of their uh, relatively recent coevolution with their host, with their hosts. All of the tens of thousands of known uh, herbs are incapable of replication, and most are very old. 
None, nevertheless, there have been a few recent insertions of this particular group of proviruses within the last few hundred thousand years, and some may be still capable of infection, and maybe we found one. We're still working on that. HML2 expression is upregulated in HIV-infected patients, um, but there is actually, we can't detect any virus in blood. I, did, I sort of skimmed over this, so not, you can take it on my word. And so a question that we're working on also is that any of these polymorphic proviruses associated with disease, such as breast cancer, particularly this this pro particular provirus here, and we're still actively working on this issue. And I'll close here. Thank um, a lot of people in the lab over the years who worked on this. Show you this lovely site from the cranberry harvest in Massachusetts. Um, this is a bog actually that um, uh, that I own, um, not too far from from uh, Boston. Um, and the important thing here is it's a beautiful. Beautiful, one of the most beautiful sights in agriculture is watching these cranberries being picked. Um, behind me, um, back over this way somewhere, uh, there's a garage. The garage has a refrigerator. The refrigerator is kept stocked with, stocked with beer. Uh, next October, if you're in Massachusetts, you're all invited to come and watch this beautiful sight and to share the beer. Uh, and I'll close there, and thank you very much. I think um, we can um, go on. Thank you very much. Well, I think, you know, if you have a couple of questions, Stuart, could you either go to the microphone in the, in the aisle there or speak up? Well, I can have Please just use the microphone because there are people uh, listening in who want to hear what Uh, first, two wonderful talks. Thank you very much for coming and enlightening me on virology. Um, I wanted to know if there's any evidence for, I guess, DNA leaving a cell and becoming a virus. That sounds like something we ought to be able to maybe observe in a lab. Um, to my knowledge, nobody has uh, been able to, to, to see that. Um, there are there's, there's evidence for sort of the opposite of that, that there are some viruses, retroviruses in particular, that have, in a sense, devolved to become just mobile DNA elements in a cell. And that there may be a lot of other mobile elements that one sees that originally started out as viruses that you don't see that relationship. But there's some, some there, there's that clear relationship. I don't know of any cases where you, it's been possible to visualize I mean, viruses may well have originated that way originally, but I don't know if there's any, I can't think of any cases where it's been possible to visualize that. So, so a big picture question is whether these retroviruses are doing us any favors. You, you sort of mentioned that, well, at least in mice, they can endogenize and protect you against new. We, you could argue that we're here because of endogenous viruses, because of the, because of the captured, the captured syncytin genes that I mentioned, the envelope genes that were expressed when we were very early, when we were all very, uh, very, very young fetuses or embryos at, at the time of formation of the placenta. And without that, the flip, then there are experiments in mice that show that if you knock those out, you get very, very defective uh, placenta formation and the mice abort at a very early age. Um, and, but that's not, in a sense, that's an accident that the virus that, that, that we've taken advantage of, just like mutations, uh, just like any other mutation, in a sense, any other favorable mutation. Um, and also, endogenous viruses have protect us from the bad, their bad relatives, their, their, their evil twins, if you like, that are out trying to infect us. Um, so it's, um, you can't say that the viruses are purposefully doing us any good, but uh, and, and so there's there's really no evidence they've done anything for us lately. <laughs> no, but there are people making arguments. Actually, there's a early expression. Some of these endogenous viruses show very distinct expression patterns in very early development, and there are people who are arguing that that in fact those are doing some good. Um, you have to argue then. Uh, that if so, they're doing something in us that they don't do in all other mammals because these are very recent 
And, and it gets a little bit hard, in my opinion, to argue something that specific uh, that recently. But it's not impossible. I think well, the, the jury's is still out. Is there anything in the fossil record that gives any clues as to the age of a hepatitis virus? Uh, pretty much I'm now in the fossil record. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, they have uncovered hepatitis B in a Korean mummy. Bob, do you remember the date? I don't remember, but it was it was pretty far back. But I don't remember the exact year. But that's as far as I know. Yeah. That was Dan Shuval's work. No, I don't know. I, I would be surprised if there are any new viruses in in the sense of of of. of, of that almost all the viruses we have probably have very, very old lineages going back to their origin or their creation as a virus. Um, yeah. Harvey, can we um, go back a little bit to hepatitis? And what do we know about the actual molecular basis for reactivation of things like hepatitis B? Why is it suddenly becomes active um, for years and years being dormant. It's something that we deal with in uh, cancer biology, and it might be something we can learn from you. Um, I doubt you learn from me, but uh, you know, I, I just see the virus as you know, it's a constant battle between the T cell and the virus. And at first the virus is there, and the T cell is not, and then it comes in, and it kills but then the virus takes off again, maybe. You know, in HCV, you know, there are these quasi-species development and new evolution of viral strains. So the virus works its way around the T cells, and then the T cells got to get new T cells. So you could have a in and out. But hepatitis B is a very strange phenomenon. But what you do know is that when you immunosuppress, you reactivate. So when you damp those T cells, the virus comes back. So presumably, they might come back. T cells may get the upper hand for a while, then lose it, then come back. That's, that's my only concept of it. Well, unfortunately, but I think all good things come to an end. I want to thank you both. This was really a, an extraordinary <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.